All rise. Court's not in session. All will judge James C. Hankinson preside. Be seated, please. We're here in the state of Florida versus Segura, 2011-2751. Let the record reflect Mr. Segura is present with his attorneys. Uh, any outstanding motions or issues we need to deal with? Uh, other than the macro pressure on her, he'll be here. And I think his flight arrives at 9 15, so he'll be here for a lunch here. Okay, so we'll plan to take it up at lunchtime. Yes. Just arrange some sandwiches. It might be a short lunch time. Um, the uh, anything else from the defense? There you We'll plan to start with the jury at now. All rise for the jury. <coughs> Everybody be seated, please. Uh, if the witness would face the clerk and be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. You can have a seat. Good morning, folks. Uh, Good morning. Sorry, too many things. Uh, going on at once. Appreciate you being back here this morning. You may proceed, Mr. Fuchs or Ms. Dugan. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. Uh, will you state your name and uh, spell it for the court reporter, please? Joanne Maltese. Last name is M A L T E S E. Thank you, Ms. Maltese. Um, and where were you working in November of 2010? 
I was working at the Tallahassee Police Department as a forensic specialist. Uh, correction, I was the supervisor at the time of the forensic unit. And how long did you work at TPD in that capacity? I worked at TPD for 26 years and in the forensics unit for 18 years, uh, supervisor for six or eight. And are you now retired? Yes, I am. And when did you retire? Uh, December of 2017. Can you tell me a little bit about your education? You said you said you were with TPD for 26 years, but your education to, become, to work in the forensics department there? Uh, my courses uh, for the forensics unit, I received over 1,500 hours of specialized courses to do with crime scene, including uh, photography, uh, blood spatter, latent print examination, crime scene reconstruction. Um, I also taught Pat Thomas Law Enforcement Academy uh, the basic recruit class in crime scene and an advanced crime scene course, which um, I also taught for police officers. Okay. And did you respond to 908 Saddle Creek um, run on no November 20th, 2010? Yes, I did. And what was your role there that day? That day I was a role of the supervisor overlooking the crime scene techs, um, getting them what they need, uh, offering any assistance that I could do. What were you and your team wearing when you processed the scene? On that particular scene, we entered with Tyvek boots and uh, complete suits on. Now those Tyvek boots and suits, is that something that um, forensics wear or that like first responders wear when they're responding to a scene, clearing a scene? Uh, typically it's going to be the crime scene units um, that will don that kind of safety equipment um, to preserve the evidence. Uh, typically the officers first responding will not don that type of equipment. Okay, so they'll have on their regular uniforms um, and y'all wear the Tyvek equipment to prevent any contamination when you're processing a scene? Yes, once the scene's been secured. Okay. Um, I want to show you a couple of photos that we looked at yesterday. represents the exterior of the house, the outside of the house, um, the side of the garage, and the front door. This is the exterior of the garage door, and on the left side is the front door. And what are all these tiny dots and arrows that we see? The markings on the garage door depict blood spatter, or small dots of blood, as well as the documentation, um, these, the scales that give us measurements um, and lines to determine uh, where I determine where the blood spatter was coming from, where each drop was coming from. Okay. You've obviously dealt with a lot of blood working in crime scene for that long at TPD. Have you also though, had training in the areas of blood spatter and blood direction? Uh, yes, I, I took a course in Miami-Dade down at their uh, training bureau for blood spatter. Okay, um, and was that like a 40-hour workshop? Yes, it was. Okay, and you also, when you taught at the <coughs> Law Enforcement Academy, did you teach in those areas as well? Yes, I did. Okay, um, were you trying here to see if you could tell anything about the blood direction of the blood spatter in this photo? Yes, in this photo, um, depicting where the blood came from, um, so the point of convergence or potentially where it came from and where it was going. And can you tell us a little bit about what you see as far as the blood direction in this photo? The markings in the photo, you will see small circles drawn. The small circles in Sharpie are where the actual blood drops were located. The lines that go through the blood drop, and they are drawn to where the blood was coming from. So the blood drop in the lower left comes from somewhere in the center of this particular, this photograph, this portion of the photograph, enlarged on the screen. And how are you able to tell where it came from? How you can tell where it came from? Blood is very viscous. It's, it's thick, slightly sticky. And when it's flying through the air, it wants to stay together. 
it's very viscous. And when it hits something, it's kind of like the reverse snowball effect, where a snowball, as it's rolling down the hill, gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it's collecting snow. Blood, once it hits something, it will continue to roll or slide, and it's losing mass. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it hits something and rolls or slides. So when we look at the drop, the big end where it hits is going to be the thickest, the widest. That's where it hit and came from. As it's rolling or sliding along, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the mass is smaller, and it ends in kind of a point or a very small area. So that's what you can tell where it's going. So where is all the blood kind of converging from in this photo? There are blood, do blood drops up on the top right, and they are coming from more of the center of the photograph. There's one in the bottom left coming from the center. So it's all converging from the center of this photo, and the blood is flying back towards the house. Correct. What about if you just have a drop of blood on the ground? What could you tell about the direction of that blood? Very similar when blood is dropped. If it's dropped at a 90 degree, it's going to hit and make a circle. If it drops at an angle, it does the same thing as it does on this wall. It's going to, where it first hits the ground, it'll be wider, and then it'll slide a little bit, so it'll be elongated. What is cast off? Cast off blood is something that is cast off your hands. If you have a cut and you're flailing around, the blood that flies off your fingers is going to be cast off. Um, if you have a weapon and you're hitting someone or hitting something with a weapon that has blood on it, the cast off is going to be the blood that flies off in any direction. Obviously, there's a lot of blood in the house, especially in the foyer area. Were you able to give us any um, insight into the blood direction in those areas? No, we were not. There was so much blood and that it was all overlapping that we could not come up with any point of convergences where it actually came from. show you 130A. What do we see in this photo? This is the foyer of the inside of the, the house with the front door at the top of the photo and suspected blood all in the foyer. The purple that you see is a dye reaction from uh, amido black. I'm sorry, not amido black. Leuco crystal violet that the crime scene techs use on that um, it reacts with proteins in your blood or proteins in particular and when it hits a protein it will dye it or stain it purple. Okay. So throughout the tile floor area and the carpet area we see some different spots, some different swipes. That could all be your saying from where the leuco crystal violet has picked up some type of protein from the tile or the carpet that was left there at some point. Yes, it illuminated or it reacted and turned some substance on the carpet in the foyer purple. And it would have to be some protein base. And what's the purpose of putting that on there? To see any, if we could find any shoe impressions or any type of impressions in the carpet that are unseen by your eye, but might still be there, microscopic um, blood or any type of um, thing that may be on the carpet. But let's try to identify any patterns. Okay. Um, were you able to identify any discernible patterns when you put down the loop of crystal violet? Uh, no, not on the carpet. Do you have any training and experience involving latent fingerprints? Yes, I do. Tell us about that. Uh, latent fingerprints, I became a latent fingerprint expert in uh, 2005. Um, several hours of training and experience as well as uh, a one-year training course at the Tallahassee Police Department where we did internal and external testing annually for our proficiency. Um, I also was a lead crime scene person in um, latent print examination, and I taught it. And have you ever testified in court where you've given an expert opinion in the field of latent print comparison or analysis? Yes, I have. About how many times? Uh, over 30 times in federal and state court. 
So there were two latent prints of value found in the home, one from the bathtub faucet in the common bathroom, and then another one on the garage doorknob, the doorknob leading from the garage door into the kitchen, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, which one did you process? Um, I did not process either of them. Uh, okay, I, I'm sorry. Which one did you make a comparison on? I compared the one that was on the doorknob of the garage door going into the kitchen. Thank you. And who, whose latent or whose standard fingerprints did you compare it to? I compared those to uh, Henry Segura and Brandy Peters. Did the uh, latent fingerprint leading from the garage door into the kitchen on that doorknob, did it match either Brandy Peters or Henry Segura? No, it did not. Okay. Could that latent fingerprint be from anyone who has been in the home and touched that doorknob? Uh, yes, anyone who's touched the doorknob. Can you tell when a latent fingerprint was left? No, I cannot. Uh, was the print entered into APHIS? Yes, it was. What is APHIS? APHIS is the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, which is a database of, in the state of Florida of any, uh, any arrestees, as well as some job application uh, fingerprints when you're fingerprinted for a job. Okay, so if you've been arrested or convicted of a crime, then the fingerprints are in APHIS? Yes. And does APHIS continually search its system for matches? Yes, this particular, particular fingerprint that was entered, as well as others, if we don't get a hit on it or a match, it will continually search. Um, and depending on the type of case, uh, it will search forever until there's a match. And once there's a match made, then the Tallahassee Police Department will be notified. All right, and there was no match identified for that particular latent print? Correct. That's all. Cross. Cool. Ma'am, you talked about how a latent print can be deposited and if undisturbed can remain discoverable for an indeterminate amount of time, generally speaking. Is that right? Yes. Um, what types of factors can impact how long a latent print can be lifted and processed? Uh, you have many different factors. You have weather factors, whether it's been washed away, whether other people have touched it, um, pretty much those type of. Um, so it, as we're talking about here, there's a latent print lifted from the inside on a doorknob. Um, can things like changing humidity, um, changing temperature, things of that nature, impact how long a latent print is going to remain discoverable? If there are extreme changes. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, that, that latent print will degrade, which is to say that the oils that caused it to be deposited in the first, first place will evaporate over time, correct? Yes, if it's made in oils, yes. And you wouldn't expect a latent print deposited on a commonly touched surface like a doorknob to remain undisturbed or uncontaminated for weeks or months on end. Would that be fair to say? Thank you. No further questions. Hey, redirect. Yes, All right, and Jerry, I have a question of this witness. All right, you can step down. Do we need to keep her further? Yes, sir. Mr. French, you need her for any reason. Thank you. All right, you're excused. Thank you for being here. Call your next witness. State call Dr. Flanagan. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony given in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Okay. Have a seat. Slide up the rail, please, man. Good morning, Dr. Flanagan. Good morning. Will you um, introduce yourself to our jury, please? Um, Dr. Lisa Flanagan. That's F-L-A-N-N-A-G-A-N. 
Thank you. And where do you work? I work as a medical examiner in this district. And how long have you worked as the medical examiner here in this district? I've been in Tallahassee since 2005. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your education, your training and experience to become the medical examiner for our district? Yes, I received my undergraduate degree from Florida State University. I then attended the University of Florida College of Medicine and I received my MD degree in 1990. And after that, I completed a five-year residency program in pathology and I did that at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And that included training in anatomy, pathology, clinical pathology, and a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology, which is my specialty. And I've worked full-time as a medical examiner in Florida since 1995. And are you a board-certified pathologist? Yes, I'm board-certified in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. About how many autopsies have you performed? At this point, over four or 5,000. What's the purpose of an autopsy? We perform autopsies as part of a death investigation. So there are certain cases where when an individual dies, the medical examiner gets involved to do an investigation. Those are homicides, suicides, accidents, anything that's not natural or a sudden unexpected death. So we will do a complete investigation and part of that usually will entail performing an autopsy so we can find out if there are any injuries and disease processes. And have you ever testified in court where you've offered an, opi um, an opinion in the field of forensic pathology? Yes, I've testified multiple times. Okay. About how many? I count over 100. Okay. Um, those are all my questions as to this witness's qualifications. Any board IRS to qualification? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Today I want to talk to you about four autopsies that you performed on November 21st, 2010. Uh, what were the names of the individuals that you performed on autopsies on that day? I performed autopsies on Brandy Peters, Tamaya Peters, Tanaya Peters, and Javanti Segura. And what information did you receive prior to the autopsies? I was notified that the four individuals were found deceased in their home. And did you perform the autopsies in the same order that you just um, named them off in? Brandy Peters, followed by Tamaya, followed by Tanaya, followed by Javante Segura? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you take photos during the autopsies? Yes. And why do you do that? As part of the autopsy, the main reason we're doing that is for documentation purposes, so I will take photographs throughout the entire process, the initial photographs before I do anything with the body, and then as I go through cleaning the body, removing the clothes, and documenting everything. I've left a couple of items up on the stand for you. Um, in the folders in front of you, 102A through VVV, 104A through R, 106A through I, and 108A through I. Are those the photos um, that you um, took during the autopsy and selected to show in court here today? Yes, they are. Okay. And were those the only photos that you took or that were taken? No, I took many more photos. Okay. Um, what was your reasoning on selecting those particular photos to show the jury today? These photos, some will show the body before I did anything. Um, and then as far as all the injuries, there was documentation of all the different injuries on the bodies. So you tried to select photos that would show the process as you went and then also all the injuries that each victim had? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and looking at those photos here in court today, would those aid you in explaining the injuries to the jury? Yes, they would. All right, so by stipulation, those are all already in evidence, um, but I want to move on to the next thing in front of you, the body diagrams that you see. 132A through I for the record and 133A through B. 
Who are those body diagrams of? These are body diagrams of Brandy Peters and Tamaya. And what are body diagrams? At the time that I'm doing the autopsy, I use body diagrams basically to jot my notes down on and to try to draw the injuries just so later when I generate the report, it's documented. Okay. Thank you. Take the initial photographs and start the documentation. Okay, so you start with the external examination of her and you start taking photos from there? Yes, she was fully clothed. She had significant injuries and there was blood on the body. Okay. When you received her body, uh, was it in a body bag? Yes. Alright. Um, and what was she wearing at the time? She was wearing a a yellow shirt and blue jean pants and socks. And how old was she? She was 27. I want to show you the first page um, in the body diagrams, 132A. What do we see here in 132A? This is the diagram of her face and the injuries that I've documented by trying to draw. There was a large open wound on her forehead and several smaller lacerations. And were any of these wounds in 132A fatal for Ms. Peters? Yes. The, the most severe injury on her whole body was the, the injury there to her forehead where it basically was open where I could see um, inside her head. You should have a pointer there. Yeah. Thank you. The wound right here. This was all crushed in and fractured, and the brain was exposed. Okay. And then 132B. These are diagrams of the right and left sides of her head. The upper photo on the right, the right side of her head, there are several lacerations. And this diagram also shows a gunshot wound there to her right ear. And then 132C. This is documenting the injuries on the back of her head. There are several lacerations. And there's also another gunshot wound that, is, that I found on the back of her head. So you're trying to draw the lacerations that you see for the approximate orientation of it, writing notes about those, and then if you see a gunshot wound, you'll detail that? That's correct. Okay. What do we see in 132D? This is a diagram of the top of her head showing the lacerations that were here on her upper forehead and also an injury here on the right top of her head. In 132E? These are brain diagrams, and on these I was documenting areas where there was bleeding um, and tissue injuries of the brain itself. These are diagrams of the skull. The, this lower one is the top of the skull. The diagram above that, this is the base of the skull, so that's what her brain would be sitting on. So that's a diagram that after the brain's removed, what you would see as far as the base of the skull. 
this is documenting all all of the gunshot wounds. There were eight total. Um, she may have been shot seven times because one, I believe, was a re-entry, but this just shows the location of all of the gunshot wounds on her body. You see numbers next to them. How did you give them a number or determine what number to give them? I don't know the order that they were inflicted. The numbering system is just what I came up with as far as documentation purposes. Can you go over with us each one of these where they're located before we see them in the photos? Yes. I have a clearer copy here that I can see. What I labeled gunshot wound one was here to the right ear that you saw in the previous um, diagram. Number two was here on the back of her head. Again, you saw that in the other diagram. Three. They were either of those gunshot wounds deep? No, the one that went in her ear, it just went a short distance and I recovered that projectile from the right side of her jaw, so it did not enter her cranial cavity. And did the one in the back of her head, did that one penetrate her skull? No, it went a short distance under the scalp and I recovered that projectile, so it did not cause any significant injury to the skull or her brain. One shot wound three is what we term a graze wound. It's just an injury on the skin itself from a projectile grazing across the skin. Gunshot wound four, which I believe is a re-entry of that graze wound. I think the projectile grazed the arm, then entered the chest up here. That wound track went through the left side of her chest and injured her left lung, and I was able to recover that projectile from over here on the left um, side of her torso. For number five, this gunshot wound here, it, it entered above her breast on the left side and the path of it was actually going downwards so it perforated the left breast, then re-entered the upper abdomen and I was able to recover that projectile from the skin so it did not enter her chest or abdomen. Gunshot wound six was here on her back that wound track was going towards her left, and it did injure the left lung as well. And I recovered that projectile from here, like her lateral shoulder on the left side. Shot wound seven is here, and this was just in and out on the superior part of her shoulder, so the bullet entered and just tracked under the skin and exited. And then eight was a wound here on her forearm that did the same thing, just entered, tracked under the skin and then exited. These are diagrams of her hands, and she had significant injuries on her hands. There, there were fractures of two fingers on this side, and then a fracture of her middle finger, and the tip of her left little finger was partially amputated. There were abrasions on the backs of her fingers, and then some skin tears as well. Okay, and you said, are, are these injuries what you would characterize as defensive-type injuries? We use the term defense-type injuries because when someone is fighting off an attacker and they're trying to protect their body, then they'll put their hands up or their, you know, their arms, and injuries they are inflicted when someone's trying to protect their body or the wounds that we will call defense type wounds. Okay. 
I made a second diagram of her hands documenting her fingernails. She did have some acrylic fingernails. Some were broken. Some fingers didn't have the nail. Um, but this diagram is just documenting the injuries of her nails. Okay. I'm going to show you the photos during the autopsy of Ms. Peters. Let me see in 102A. This is a photograph of one of the one of the initial photographs of her body, which is how she was um, before I did anything with her. So you can see her clothing, there's blood on the clothing and on her body, and this is what she looked like when I first saw her. What is be? This is an initial photograph showing the lower part of her body. She had blue jeans on and socks. This is a view just from the other side of her body showing the blue jeans with blood on them and her socks. And this is showing the other side of her again before I do anything. So it's just documenting the state of her body. This is showing her face before I cleaned any of the blood off. She did have a wig on, and here you can see it's kind of pulled back. Let me see 102F. This is after I cleaned the blood off her face there are a few of these lacerations on the skin, and right here on her ear is the gunshot wound. This is showing her forehead with an injury here where the skin is split and these other individual injuries. These are impacts to her head that's causing the skin to split. Another view showing that cluster of injuries on the right side of the forehead, the injury here along the hairline and part of the larger wound on her face. This is showing the large gaping wound. There may be multiple impacts here that created this. The skull is fractured under here. There's bruising of the skin of her eyelids, and there was actually some froth here where the blood was mixing with the air that was in her sinuses. There were several injuries of her scalp, so in order to be able to document those, I had to shave her hair, so that's why her hair is gone here. Um, and this is showing several of the impact sites on the right side of her head. And then this is showing more towards the top of her head. So there's a large laceration here on the top of her head. L. This was the laceration on her upper forehead. And once I shaved the scalp in that area, I could see it was a continuation. So it continued under the hairline. 
SUN? This is documenting the wound there on the top of her head, and you can see it has a curved configuration. And these are, they're small tears here, so these wounds I can tell cause from something blunt striking her head, and it's splitting the skin. It's not caused by something sharp, such as a knife. The left side of her head, there were not as many lacerations here, but there is bruising on her cheek. Yes, it is. So what we're about to see is going to be um, the inside of her head after you peel back the scalp to look at these injuries, her skin to look at these injuries. Yes, as part of the autopsy, I will make an incision on the scalp and reflect it back so that I can look at the underside of the scalp as well as the skull. This is showing the scalp reflected back, so you are looking at the right side of her head. Here at the bottom is her right ear, and so an incision has been made over the top of her head, and the scalp has been pulled forward and backward. And what this is showing are all these areas of hemorrhage that were associated with those impact sites that you could see as far as the lacerations. This is another photograph of the scalp reflected, and this time it's the left side of her head where there are areas of hemorrhage here, but not as much on the left side. This is showing more the top of the head, so the scalp has been reflected back up and is covering her face. And this is her upper forehead area where there is an actual fracture of the skull. So this would be the um, underlying portion of the gaping hole that we saw? No, this would be the underlying portion of the laceration that was the upper forehead that extended the into the scalp that was covered with hair. And what are we seeing in one or two R? This is a close-up of that. So you can see the circular configuration of the fracture itself. There's some hair that's embedded that was carried down um, and embedded in the fracture line, and then some radiating fractures that extend from the edge of it. This is the left side of her head, and what this is showing is another depressed fracture that was here on the left upper forehead. And this is not as round, it's more oblong, but this is a depression. This is a close-up of that injury where this portion of her skull is actually, it's a depressed fracture. So you said that all the injuries that we just saw in her head, those are a result of some, she being struck with an object, impacted with an object in her head. Yes, multiple times. Okay. Um, would there be, can you give us the, an amount of force behind these blows? I can't give a specific number, but there's significant force that used on her head and face resulted in all the injuries of the skin, but also resulting in depressed skull fractures and several contusions of the brain itself. 
and you said in the body diagram that one of these wounds in particular was fatal. The one to her face where there were several blows directly onto her face, that was what basically opened up her skull and exposed the brain. It was this trauma to her head, was it likely caused by a fist or an object? There may be some impacts from a fist, but most of these would be from some object, an object with some weight that is used with quite a bit of force to cause the injuries that I'm seeing. Could it be, could these, um, the lacerations and the fractures you're seeing be consistent with being struck or beaten with a firearm? Yes, they could be. And, and why? <clears throat> well, they're, the two depressed fractures, one's roughly round and the other's oblong, that could be caused by the butt of a gun. The other lacerations may be caused by impacts with the gun that just split the skin in various orientations. I want to show you what we've pre-marked and shown to defense a state's exhibit 147. Um, and a best stipulation judge 147 will be entered. Is that correct, Mr. Print? Yes, sir. Could be admitted. <coughs> All right, looking at states 147, there was no gun recovered in this case, but what you're looking at here, I showed you this before court today, correct? Yes, you did. And this is a, a 32 revolver. Um, and I wanted to talk about what you said that <clears throat> the circular fracture and the oblong fracture that we see in 102R and 102I, or the circular, I guess, impression and the oblong impression, that those could be caused, you said, by the butt of a gun or the handle of a gun? Yes. Okay. And you said that, you know, looking at the different surfaces of this revolver here, the, the handle, the trigger guard, the hammer, the barrel, the muzzle, a gun is an object with multiple surfaces, right? The cylinder? Yes, that's cool. Okay. And any, I guess, uh, combination of those surfaces could have possibly caused the different types of lacerations that we see on her head. Yes, that is correct. Okay. But these two in particular, the oval and the circular, would be consistent with the handle or the butt of a revolver of a revolver of this type. Yes, there's a, a curved surface here, but yes, that area, it may not be impacting the skull exact same spot on the gun, but it could be different angles of the gun striking the skin to result in different configurations of the fractures. Okay. Um, and then we see in one or two of you. This is a photograph of an x-ray that I took, and when someone's been shot, we will take x-rays so that we can see where the bullets are so that they can be recovered. And in this case there, here at the bottom, this was a tongue stud, but there's a projectile that was here on the right side of the jaw, and that was the projectile that came in the right ear wound and just traveled a short distance there. And then up here, there's a projectile, and that's the one that's on the back of the head. Let me see in one or two of these. This is showing the back of her head with the with all of these injuries and with the x-ray, I knew there was a projectile or a gunshot wound back here and it ended up that this actually was a gunshot wound. And then what is your W? This is a photograph 
showing the top of her head, and I have a probe in the gunshot wound. Were you able to tell from this which direction the projectile traveled? Yes, I have the probe showing the direction it went, and I recovered the projectile, this photograph showing the projectile where it was embedded in the scalp itself. And one of two, why? What do we see here? This is a photograph of that projectile. So during the autopsy, I will recover the projectiles and secure it as evidence. This is then at that point you handed over to law enforcement? Yes. What do we see in one of two, Z? This is a photograph of the wound here and there's black soot around the entry wound and I called this a loose contact so I think the gun was very close to her head with that wound because soot that came out with the projectile was deposited around the wound. So for soot to be deposited, you said the gun would have to be at close contact? No, I'd say a loose contact. Loose contact, thank you. And when you say loose contact, can you give us any um, range of speed, anything like that? It's within inches or an inch or so of the skin, just enough for that soot. It's not spread very far. It's just right around the wound. What do we see here in 102AA? This is just a closer view of that same entry wound showing the soot. Uh, this is showing her earlobe pulled forward to show that it did perforate the earlobe and then entered behind the ear. This is a photograph with the probe through the wound showing how it perforated the ear and then re-entered behind the ear. And were you able to, where the projectile traveled, be able to recover this projectile? Yes, I was. All right. And one or two DD, what do we see? This is a photograph of the x-ray showing the projectile that goes with that wound track. And one or two DD? This is a photograph of the projectile after I removed it. What do we see in 102 FF? This is the gunshot wound that I called a graze wound. So it did not go very deep at all. It just traveled across the surface of the skin. And 102 GG? This is a close-up of that injury. Did you see any type of stippling on this injury? There was a little bit of stippling here. And stippling is caused by unburned powder flakes that come out of the end of the gun. They have a little bit more weight than the powder or soot, so they will they can strike the skin and actually cause these little abrasions that they won't wash off. They're actually injuries of the skin, and that just indicates that the gun was close enough to the body that the unburned powder flakes were striking the skin. How close would a gun need to be to cost it? It varies with the gun and the type of ammunition, but within a couple feet. This is the what I call the re-entry wound. So it grazed the arm and then re-entered the body here on the right upper chest. And one or two II. 
this is a close up of that wound. Was there any soot or stippling from gunpowder on this wound? No. <coughs> she did have a shirt on, though, correct? Yes, she did have a shirt. When the bullet, the bullet passes through clothing, and sometimes um, the clothing um, keep you from seeing the soldier stippling that may have been there if she hadn't that shirt on? Yes, it can shield the skin, and then the soot and the powder would be deposited on the clothing. Let me see one or two J This is after her chest plate has been lifted off, her anterior chest. So what you're seeing, here are her lungs. Here is the right lung, and then the left lung is on this side. And so this is what the lung should look like, but her left lung, you can see the wound track here where there's hemorrhage and an injury where the bullet passed through the lung. This is a, a photograph with the probe where it's showing the direction that the bullet traveled. So I have it oriented where the, where the entry wound is, and then this was the path that it took through the torso. This is a photograph of her chest after I've removed the lung, and the probe is showing the path that the bullet took and where it exited the left side of her chest. Were you able to recover this projectile? Yes, I am. Have you seen one or two in him? This is a photograph of the chest x ray, and you can see here outside of the chest cavity in the skin is the projectile. This is where I recovered that projectile. This photograph shows her arm here and then the left side of her chest and the bullet was just under the skin and so I had to incise the skin to remove the bullet. This is a photograph of that projectile. This is a photograph of her left breast, and there was a gunshot wound that traveled downward. It entered here at the top of the breast and then perforated and exited the bottom of the breast. And one two QQ? This is a close up of that wound. And one or two RR? This is a the one that you just showed was the entry wound, and this is a close-up of the exit wound from the breast. Um, tell us earlier how clothing can kind of act as an intermediary to keep you from seeing soot or stippling. Does hair have the same effect? Yes. If, if someone shot in the head in the scalp, the hair there can shield it, and she also had a wig on that would shield it. One or two SS, what do we see? This is a photograph with the probe inserted to show the wound tract and then how it continued to re-enter down here on the abdomen. And then one or two TT. This is a close-up of the re-entry wound on the abdomen. And did this bullet cause any significant injuries? No. One or two UU. This is a photograph of the x-ray of the abdomen, and it shows the projectile that I recovered. This is a photograph of the abdominal skin, and I recovered the projectile from the skin, and it did not 
enter the abdominal cavity at all. This is a close-up view of the projectile that was situated here in the skin. This is a photograph of the projectile that I recovered. This shows her back, and right here on the left side of the back is a, another entry gunshot wound. This is a close up of that wound. This showing the inside of the left chest cavity after the lung's been removed, so it entered her back and it did pass through the left chest cavity and injured the lung. And your This is showing the left lung, so there was the one wound tract here through the front of the lung and then a second gunshot wound tract through the back of the lung. And this is a photograph of the x-ray showing her left shoulder area, and this is where I recovered that projectile. And this is where I incised the skin to recover the projectile. This is a photograph of the projectile that I recovered. What do we see in 102 FFF? This is an injury, a gunshot wound of the shoulder that um, just passed under the skin. Looking at 102 GGG, where we see. This is showing the entry wound, and here you're seeing stippling where the, the gun was close to the body for the stippling to result. And you said before that that would have been a couple, of, the gun would have been within a couple of feet? As a general estimate, usually within a couple of feet. This is showing the exit wound, so it entered here at the top of the shoulder and then passed just under the skin to exit here, okay. the left upper back. This is a photograph with the probe along the wound track just to demonstrate the direction and path that the projectile took. What can you tell us about her orientation and her orientation to the gun for this gunshot? I can see the direction that the bullet traveled, so I know the gun, in this, for this particular wound, the gun would have to be in front of her and slightly to her left. What about 102 JJJ? What do we see here? This is her right forearm, and you can see the two wounds here when there's an entry and an exit. And in the last one, you were not able to recover a projectile, right? Right, for these two wounds, this one on the shoulder and the one on the arm, the bullet exited, so that was, I did not recover the bullet. I think bullets. I'm sorry, so what do we see in one two JJJ? Another perforating gunshot wound with an entry and an exit. What about 
about one and two KKK? This is a close up of the entry wound, and here you can see the stippling around the wound. About one or two LLL. This is a close up of the exit wound for that wound track. For that wound track. About one or two N N N. This is a photograph with the probe through the wound track. So no um, projectile recovery. No. So how many gunshot wounds total did Brandy Peter suffer? I documented eight separate wounds, but the the one on the arm may be the same bullet as the one that ended the chest. <clears throat> it might have been one bullet of the two points. Right, so at least seven. Um, considering all of these gunshot wounds, can you tell whether a suspect was shooting up at her or down at her or her orientation for every single one? They all have different orientations, some from the back, from the side, so I think she was trying to get away and moving and fighting. Okay. Did any of the gunshot wounds cause significant injuries? The only significant injuries were the two that injured that left lung, but those would not be immediately fatal and she would still be able to function after sustaining those. So you said, so she would still be able to, to run after sustaining those gunshot wounds that entered her lung? Yes. Okay. And would she still, um, you said it would be consistent with her moving around and not being stationary when she's receiving all these gunshot wounds? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and can you tell us the order of these gunshot wounds? Can you tell which one came first? No. Can you determine whether she was shot first or beaten first? I can't exclude that they're both going on, but how she ended up, I believe she was being shot that it wasn't killing her. I mean, she had two gunshot wounds to her head and neither one of those did anything. Um, several of the others were just entries and exits that didn't cause any significant injuries. So she was still functioning after that. And I believe after that was when she sustained all the head injuries. Her right hand, where you can see the, there's some swelling. There's actually a fracture of her finger and all of these injuries to the skin. And one or two, oh, oh, oh. This is another view showing the purple swelling and injury of that middle finger. And one or two, P. This is showing the palmar surface. Again, you can see here the purple discoloration with bruising and fracture. And one of QQQ. This is a x-ray of her hand that demonstrated the fracture of the fingers. This is her left hand, again, similar injuries. There's purple discoloration, which is bruising. There's some abrasions. There's a fracture of the middle finger. And then there is a 
what I call a partial amputation of the tip of that, the little finger. The tip of the little finger. This is a photograph of that injury on the finger. This is a photograph of the palmar surface of the left hand with these areas of bruising at the base of the thumb and involving several fingers. This is a photograph that's showing there's an actual injury of the web between the index and middle fingers where there's a skin tear. This is a photograph of the x-ray of her left hand and you can see here the middle finger is fractured. Some natural nails and some acrylic nails? Yes. Okay. Um, looking at these injuries to her hands that you've shown us, are these more consistent with her hands hitting another person's body or hitting an object? I think it's an object striking her hands to result in the fractures, but she's not going to generate enough force hitting something to cause the, the degree of injuries that we see here. Okay, so the injuries that we're seeing would have been caused by her stretching out at someone. They would have been caused by an object striking her in the hands. That's what it appears to be, yes. Okay. Um, so, and when you say an object striking her in the hands, I know you talked a little bit about defensive injuries. And by that, you said you mean if she were to be being beaten in the head and be putting up her hands like this or like this, cover herself or to try to shield herself? Yes, these are all injuries that are similar to the injuries that she's receiving to her head and face. Okay. Um, if she were to have been able to try to stop defending herself for a minute and be able to strike out at her attacker, um, would you expect to see injuries on that attacker if he or she he were to be wearing long clothing or long material over his skin? No, not in areas that are covered with clothing. Okay. Does clothing act as an intermediary? Just because you were telling us about earlier that sometimes just for gunpowder, it can also do the same thing for um, someone striking you with your with a hand or a nail? Yes, it can. The clothing can protect the skin. Her hands and her head were the only parts of her body that you saw injuries that were consistent with being struck by an object, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you also do an internal examination of Brandy Peters? Yes, I did. Okay. And in that internal examination, did you look at the contents of her stomach? Yes, I did. Um, what, what were you able were you able to tell us about the contents of her stomach? I just described it as brown, cloudy liquid, and she did have a few fragments of some parts digested food. What does that tell you? Just that she had eaten within a few hours. Okay. Are you able to get us any specific amount of time? No. Mm -hmm. But it's just within a few hours? Right. She still has some food that's being digested in her stomach. Yes, this, this is the reason you're not able to give us an exact time because people metabolize at different rates? Right, it varies. The, 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 um, depends on what, what was eaten, how much liquid is in there, because the stomach's trying to digest it before it moves it into the next, into, into the small intestine. So too many variables for you to give us an exact amount, but it's within a few hours of her eating she would have died. Yes, it has not cleared out of her stomach. I could be, I'm sorry. It has not cleared out from her stomach. What was the time frame you did? Just within a few hours. 
Did you also do a sexual assault examination kit of Ms. Peters? Yes. And um, what, what is that? It's uh, just evidence that we collect um, as far as swabs of the vaginal area, anus, mouth, and that sort of thing. And did you take, you said, so you took swabs of all those different areas of her body that you just named? Yes. Okay. Um, and then at that point, did you put the swabs back into the kit, turn it over to law enforcement? Yes, I did. Did you notice any injuries or signs of trauma when you did the public exams for her as part of the sexual assault examination kit? I did not notice any injuries. No. Okay. And were you able to determine the cause of death? Yes. And what was it? I ruled the cause of death as blunt traumatic injuries of the head and face and multiple gunshot wounds. So what would be the main cause? <laughs> the main cause would be the impacts to her head with the injuries, obviously the open wound on the face, but all the traumatic injuries of the brain. Um, I might get a good sign. Yeah, I was going to say, before you move another one, you need to take a break. All right, we'll take 15 minutes. Either side need anything. All right, just leave your notes, have it step out. Definitely.